Tyler's message is sin, S-I-N. I almost didn't spell it. I mean, three letters, you think I get that right? S-I-N, sin. Sin's not a good thing. Uh, by the way, open your Bibles in Romans chapter 6, and we'll just do a little springboard off of that and uh, go from there. But Glory to God. As you're going, I've got, I got several little paragraph thoughts up here, but we were told in Bible school, Rainbow Bible Training Center, I mean, that's the greatest thing on this planet. Me and I left there in 1984 telling everybody we met that it should be written in the New Testament somewhere that if you want to go to heaven, Go to Rainbow Bible Training Center. I thought that's how much we just that's how much value we put on that. It was just such a great institution and still is as I understand it. But that was in the early 80s when we were there, and it's just an awesome school. It just done so much for us. But one of the things that they taught <coughs> was not to spend too much time on the subject of sin and preaching. In, 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 these are all future ministers that they're talking to. To not, not spend a whole lot of time preaching on sin because it would build a sin consciousness into people. It build a sin consciousness in them and to, to the point where they, they, they're just afraid everything they do is wrong. Well, that can happen, but you know, we we gotta learn to live balanced lives. You know that we're going if you sin, don't panic. <laughs> no, just don't panic. There's a there's a remedy for it. It's called the blood of Jesus. It's called repentance. And I mean, just get before God now, <laughs> right now. And then, Father, forgive me. Oh, in Jesus' name, Lord, I messed up. They told us, we well, go ahead and teach, major on teaching righteousness because that's what we've been made to be, is the righteousness of God. And those thoughts are true, not to spend a lot of time on sin, but more on righteousness. But the interesting thing about that thought is the word sin is found 113 times in the New Testament. Just that word, sin, is found 113 times in the New Testament. Righteousness is found 99 times. I mean, just suggesting to me that there's just a little bit more emphasis put on, you know, understanding the, you know, the problem of, of what sin will do in our lives as opposed, you know, the benefit of righteousness. Now, there's, the benefit of righteousness is you can't put a value on that because being born again has made you and I to be the righteousness of God. I mean, it's just an act of, it's just a work of the Holy Ghost. That word righteousness means we have been placed in right standing with God. Yes. Only Jesus' blood can do that for anybody. So we approach, you know, heaven with repentance. Oh, God, forgive me. I'm sorry. I've sinned. I want to be saved. And, and the Holy Ghost gets involved with that, with that repentance. And, and, and he comes in where the sinner is concerned and makes a new creature out of them and they're born again and placed into right standing with God. But I'll tell you something. If, if you just fool around with sin long enough, it'll violate that righteousness. It'll mess with that right standing. Contrary to a lot of, of opinion out there in the church world. There are people out there telling that, that once saved, always saved. You're born again. Relax. You know, just live life any way you want. A very good pastor friend of mine, been in the ministry for many years, told me, <laughs> you know, basically once saved, always saved. He didn't use those words. That's what he was saying. Just be born again and you're going to heaven. That's what he said. And I said, you mean it doesn't matter how I live? I can go to heaven anyway? He said, I know it doesn't sound right, but that's basically about right. That's the words he used. Well, I thought about that for several years. And I think, there's something wrong with that. I mean, I put great value on my friendship and relationship with this pastor friend of mine. But, but he's, he's just among many thousands of ministers who believe that. That once you are born again, genuinely born again, saved by the blood of Jesus, that you can just live life any way you want to, and it doesn't matter, you're going to heaven. Well, there's a lot of problems with that. And we're certainly not going to cover all of them this evening. But we're going to look at some of them. Uh, the problem of sin in our lives. The writers of the New Testament had more to say about sin than they did righteousness. And that's because of the destructive ability that sin has. Romans chapter 6, if you found that, verse 23, it says the wages of sin is death. Y'all see that? Yes. Born, and he, listen, he wrote that to a born-again church. That's in the book of Romans. This is a letter that he wrote to a church in Rome. The wages of sin is death, both physically and spiritually and any otherly way that <laughs> you want to think about. Sin will bring death. 
when, when it's finished. When it's finished, we're going to look at that. I think, let me find that just a second, see if I can find that. I got it wrote down here somewhere or another. Uh, yeah, James 1 15. Just hold your place there. We may come back to this. Look at James 1 15. I had that way over in my notes, but we'll just go there right now. Blessed be God. Hallelujah. Y'all found James chapter 1? Yeah. Verse 15 says, When lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Well, just because you sin once doesn't necessarily mean death of any kind is really going to do any damage in your life. But it is necessary to repent of it. Because sin, I think a whole lot like vitamins, it's accumulative. You just keep messing with it, it keep growing. <coughs> bad turns into worse, and worse turns into really awful, and awful turns into horribly bad, and after what you fall over very. Because that's what sin does. It'll just take you down a path that you wish you hadn't went down. Yeah. At the end of that path is a hole in the ground. Not to mention where your body's concerned, but there's a hole in hell where your spirit is concerned. Sin will destroy you. Make you feel good where you're going or just get you a bunch of cocaine and a bunch of pornography and a bunch of beer and a bunch of whatever goes with all that stuff and just stay with it. You'll feel good until your eyes close and your heart quits. But this is not the only life we have to live. There's another life. And everybody's going to live in that next life in hell or heaven, one of the two. But, but, but sin, when it's finished, I mean, the wages of sin is death, it says here. It doesn't mean just, just because you committed a sin some kind, you're going to die. Or anything about you going to die, but but when it's the finished work of it, open a door to a horrible disease of some kind. I mean, disease is already here. Adam opened that door, bring it to everybody. But you know, all you and I, you and I got to do is get real familiar with sin and buddy up with sin of some kind. And there's a door where our life person is concerned. It doesn't mean that just because we got sick of some kind that we sin, but it certainly will open a door to sin. There's a guy who got healed of some disease. I don't know what it was, and we could find it. I don't know. Jesus' ministry, and uh, when, when that moment came and gone, he said, go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come on you. So our personal individual sins can, can invite a worse thing in our life. And so it's just real important, I think, for you and I to understand that when flesh has its way and we did wrong, I mean, that's probably... Jesus made this statement. He said, take up your cross daily. You know why he said do that? Because daily sin is trying to get away in your life. Daily sin is trying to do something where our lives are concerned. Because daily we're, we're draped in this flesh. Daily we live in this flesh body. And this body is a carnal natured thing. He just likes sin. Likes it. You have to make a conscious decision to refuse it. Being married tonight, it don't hurt. I mean, she said, you touch that and I'll break both of your arms. <laughs> no, she didn't <coughs> I read her mind, though. <laughs> Amen. She said, you do that and I'll tell the pastor. I am the pastor. Okay, I'll break the pastor's arm. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sin will hurt you guys. Amen. Bad. It'll hurt you bad. Satan is not playing any game. God's not playing any games, for that matter. But the devil is just, in fact, the, the scriptures tell you and I in, in first. Peter chapter 5 said, Satan goes about as a roaring lion seeking, seeking, looking, whom he may devour. He's constantly looking for somebody to devour. And for him to do that, he's got to have a legal right to do it. Either our ignorance, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, Hosea said, Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. So he's looking for a, a legal entry to, to lies people to bring destruction. Well, sin is a sign. Hey, devil, come over here and destroy me. I mean, that's what sin does. He gives the devil an invitation. He goes around seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for somebody that's dabbling in sin, fooling with sin, living an unrepented life. I mean, just because you had a weak moment, flesh ruled for uh, just a moment, doesn't mean that the devil's got to, you know, can just automatically come in and bring destruction. But you do need to repent of that moment. Because the enemy will come because of that moment. But the sooner you can repent, the better. I don't understand what I'm trying to say. Sin's a bad deal. It feels good. I mean, you understand it. The Bible says Moses refused the pleasures of Egypt uh, for uh, the sin of Egypt. I mean, go back and read it again. 
called it a pleasure, sin was a pleasure, but he refused it because he put more value in his relationship with God than he did with, with the sinful nature of things. And we need to learn to do the same thing because if you don't, after a while, you'll find yourself in James 1, chapter, chapter 1, verse 15. When it's finished, it'll bring forth death. Next thing you know, you're calling the pastor. Oh, pastor, hit me, hit me. <laughs> well, that's what we're here for. <laughs> Every way we can. And, and you know, and we, we appreciate your phone call. But there's just a lot of things you can avoid on your own. I mean, that, like we said, well, go the atmosphere in your home, or go light years ahead, you know, a, a, a protecting you spiritually. Have worship songs going in there. Praise songs going in there. I'm right now trying to get a song put in the computer. Uh, Nicholas was supposed to come recently and he's got tied up could be here. I have the music in the computer, but the, the, there's several programs in my computer over here in the, in the sound booth. And on, on, in one program, I got the music, wording, I mean the singing. In, in, the other, in another program, I got the words of it. I need to get the two together. <laughs> so I'm putting them all up here and I don't have to get But the title of it is, I Am the Righteousness of God. Dave Dean will sing that song. He wrote that song many years ago. There's a church threw him out of that church because of it. He sang that in their church many years ago and that subject of, of that revelation of that we are the righteousness of God, people didn't have that revelation back then. And when he came into this Pentecostal church singing, I am the righteousness of God in Christ, they threw him out. They said, there's none right. There's no, not one. Well, that is a verse in, in, in Paul's writing, Romans chapter 3, I think. We can find it. But he, Romans chapter 3 is quoting Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there was none righteous. No, not one. Well, Paul's trying to tell them that now there is somebody that's righteous. All that is accepted Christ and made to be new creatures in Christ Jesus, they're, they're, they're righteous. And so he wrote that song, I Am the Righteousness of God in Christ. And it's a real good song. I have it back there. I just need to get the music and the words together so I can put it on the Lord. Anyway, how do we get on all that? I don't know. Put music in your house. Put music in your home. Let it play. Let it clean the atmosphere. There are people, I don't know them personally, I know of them. They're real estate folks out here in the, I don't know if they're real estate people, no, maybe it's just somebody that was buying a house in California. <clears throat> well, California, you buy a house out there in Los Angeles or San Francisco, that's a good place to get a devil. You don't know who lived in that house before you got there. But these people would take a tape player and, and, and they put the New Testament, continuous play New Testament, for 48 hours in that house. Crank it up. Well, I mean, crank the volume up and let that thing, let the word just play. That's, Alexander Scorby is the one that was narrating the Bible. And he's probably one of the best that I know is out there. But uh, they let that play for 48 hours and then the home that they're going to buy. And it just clears the atmosphere. I mean, if there's a devil in there, they're gone. There's a man want me to come cast the devil out of his house one time. And I said, I will on one condition. He said, what's that? I said, you can get you some praise and worship music. Praise and worship. I'm not talking about Southern Gospel. That's good stuff. I mean, I like it. But get praise and worship music and play it for two days. And I'll come. And he never would do that. Mm. And so I never did go. I thought, if you like devils, well, you can just keep them. <laughs> <coughs> I want to just come in and mop up. I want the Lord to do the work. I just come in and mop up. <laughs> I just plead <laughs> blood and declare what the Scripture says over the house and the property and there's a devil there, and I'm, I'm confident he's still there. I don't know. He said he was sitting in his recliner one night, and he said, Drick, this arm, this hand has got a hold of his arm right there. He said, lift the indentations of the print of fingers on his arm where got a hold of it, trying to pull him out of that chair. And then a lot of other stuff like that. So, you know, he looks around, there's nobody there. He's the only one in the house, yet that happens to him. Well, there's a devil doing that. And uh, that sort of thing goes on. But, but the bright kind of music in the home, well, this... I mean, it's nice to just come from the workplace where they just beat your brains out all day long with one kind of problem or another and come into a comfortable setting, just a feel-good environment. That's really important to be able to do that. And I learned to do that many years ago. And it was just, it was just great for, for, your, for, your, for your growth in the Lord and your, in your spiritual walk. makes a big difference. Hallelujah. The biggest danger in preaching about sin is creating condemnation in people. Because they, you know, we have one do wrong from one time to another. We try not to, but it happens. And if you're not careful, you'll, you'll begin to feel some kind of condemnation over it. Let me just help you out. God is not condemning you for nothing. 
I mean, you can go shoot whoever you want to shoot and their neighbors. And God will not condemn you for that. The Holy Spirit will convict you till you can't stand it, though, for it, but he's not going to condemn you for it. The Holy Ghost will do everything he can to bring you to a place of repentance for whatever wrong you may have done. But he's not going to condemn you. Well, all right. We'll just, we'll just work our way to it. Look at John chapter 3, verse 17. Just so you know I ain't making this up. That's what I want people to look at the Bible while I'm reading it, and, and while I'm reading it, while I'm ministering, so they can see with their own eyes that what I'm saying is out of the book. I was, met, I was called to come and minister to, minister at a men's prayer breakfast after at Harrison not long ago. And, and so I went and I told them, there's about, I don't know, 15 or so men sitting there. And uh, uh, when I stepped up there to minister, I said, uh, I hope y'all brought a Bible or have a Bible to use right now because I said, I need you to see what I'm saying because I might be lying to you. <laughs> I said, I'm going to try not to lie to you, doing my best not to lie to you, but I want you to know that what I'm telling you is in this book. And I want them to see the same thing I'm saying. Anyway, John chapter 3, verse 17. Look at it in your Bible. It's in red letters in mine. It said, God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. He's not here to condemn it. He's not here to condemn it. Kenneth Hagin made this statement one time. He said, he said, there's just a lot of bad sins of one kind or another in this world. He said, one of the sorriest things that I guess anybody could think of being a terrible sin would be homosexuality. We think that's the worst thing. You know, that's worse than shooting your grandmother, I guess, in some people's mind. But he said, God's not condemning them people of that. Why are you? I mean, he just worded it that way. We find ourselves condemning the people for the sin. Well, God condemns the sin. He doesn't condemn the sinner. The blood of Jesus has paid the penalty for their sin, so he doesn't condemn them. That doesn't mean condemnation won't come into your life. It's just not from God. This right here says, God sent not his son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already, because them that believe not are attached to their sin, attached to the sin nature, attached to the author of sin, Satan, and that's already judged. And there's condemnation in that. But beyond that, look at Romans chapter 8. Let me just take you for a little walk in the Bible here this evening. Romans chapter 8. Glory to God. I'll show you something in Romans chapter 8. There is condemnation for the child of God, but it's not from God. It's something that we need to understand. If you found Romans chapter 8, Amen. look at verse 1. There is, therefore, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Is that a period after Jesus or a comma? comma. That's a comma. Isn't that right? That's not a period. It's a comma. The sentence is not finished. Therefore, there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Well, have, well, what happens if I walk after the flesh? There is condemnation. But it's not from God. Not from God. Look at 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Verse 20 in John chapter 3. In fact, John chapter 3, say amen. 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 Verse 20, for if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows all things. If our heart condemns us, but beloved, if our heart condemns us not, then have we confidence toward God. So where's the condemnation coming from? Your own spirit is condemning you. That's a blood pump. Not, it says heart, it's not blood pump. It's your own spirit. is kicking your rib cage, <laughs> kicking your rib cage. I say, why, why are you doing that stupid thing? <laughs> You're feeling a sense of condemnation, but it's coming from you out of your own spirit. And then the devil jumps up here in your ear and he amplifies that. Say, yeah, you sorry thing. If you was a real Christian, you wouldn't have never done that. Yada, 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 yada. <laughs> but God doesn't condemn us for our failures and our sins. But your own spirit, that your own man and the ember, the, the ember and man will make you feel horrible for that wrong that you did. And that's what brings us to our knees in repentance. That's what brings us to that place of, oh God, forgive me. If that wasn't there, if you didn't have a problem sinning, you'd just keep on sinning. But that's in there. Your own spirit is that is that governor, I guess you can say it that way, if you know what a governor is. 
uh, it brings that check to her life. Said, man, you need to read. You mean you, you shouldn't have done that to start with? You, you knew you shouldn't have. You felt the Holy, Spirit, Holy Spirit. You felt your own spirit, your ember man, trying to get you not to say what you say or did what you did. But now that you've done it, you really feel bad about it. Well, that's your spirit man can bring that condemnation in there. It's not from God. We need to understand. It's really important you understand that. God loves you. But the thing about it is, if you continue unrepentant in sin, when it's finished, you'll die. Kenneth Hagin made this statement one time. He said, death in the New Testament never means cessation of life. It never means the, 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 the end of life. You'll live on. You, death, <laughs> you'll live on. But death in the New Testament, very few times I know anything about, is talking about your flesh. Most of the time it's talking about separation from God. Spiritual death, separation from God. Amen. But that condemnation that you sense, that feel bad that you sense for what you did wrong is a good thing because he'll, bring, he'll, he'll lead you back into a repentant state of, you know, to repent. Oh God, forgive me. Oh Lord, forgive me. We're in 1 John chapter 3, back up to 1 John chapter uh, uh, 1. 1 John chapter 1. Verse 8, it says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 9, If we confess our sin, this is a letter written to Christian people, born again people. If we confess our sins, if you confess the very thing that you're feeling condemned about, again, that's your own spirit, man, beating you up on the inside, telling you, you need to get, you get, you know, get forgiveness of that. Get forgiveness of that. He likes to be in, your ember man likes to be in fellowship with God. Amen. If we confess our sins, he, look at it, it says, He, God, is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He'll not only forgive you, but He'll cleanse you from whatever you did wrong. And at the end of the day, if you do that all day long, at the end of the day, you look back, there's no sin back there. You could have fouled up royally all day long, not meaning to, didn't want to, trying not to, maybe you did want to a time or two, I don't know, but you repent of it. According to 1 John 1 9, at the end of the day, God has forgiven you. Every time you confessed it, He's forgiven you. And not only forgiven you, but He's cleansed you of it as though you never did it. People have taken that verse. I've heard them preach it every way in the world and talk it every way in the world and believe it every way in the world. I mean, after about 45 years, you learn a few things. But there's a lot of people going to that verse and, and, and went to that as a license. They took that as a license to live any way they want to. After all, all I, all I got to do is confess that God forgives it. Now, that's been presumptuous. That, that's been, uh, uh, there's another word or two for it, but uh, uh, they take it as a license that they can live, and live, live any life any way they want to, but it's not a license, it's a safety net. Because when you sin, you fail. There's a falling. There's a spiritual falling involved, and it's a safety net to catch you, and so that when you repent of that sin and, 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 and Claim the blood, the power of the blood of Jesus and, and worship God. Thank Him for His grace and His mercy to forgive you. Yeah, that'll put you back up on your spiritual feet. And you can live to fight another day. Amen. Amen. It's not a license. It's a safety net to catch you. In verse 10, He goes, says, If we say we haven't sinned, we make Him a liar. And His word is not in us. And there's a, several reasons why that says that because of the doctrines of the day. But we're not going to get into that today. But 1 John 1 9 should be something that we remember and have in our spirit, and just, I mean, not just memorize, but have it in our spirit just like we do John 3 16. I'm confident just near, everybody here can quote John 3 16. We've read it all our life, you know, I've heard it all our life. But this 1 John 1 9 should be inside us just like that John 3 16 is. I mean, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, who shall believe in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's John 3, 16. We can just sing it. We can quote it backwards. I mean, somehow that's just down in us. This verse right here should be in us in the same manner because it may not be before dark tomorrow. You're going to need that verse. If without that verse, the devil can lie to you, hound you, trouble you, bug you. I mean, there's people who have been drove out of the mind. And shot. It was just on the news. That I think a 20-year-old girl, 18-year-old girl, whatever she was, took a shotgun and killed herself. She threatened to kill the students at Columbine High School back there. I don't know how old she was. I may be off from that age part. But she bought a shotgun with the idea of going into Columbine, Colorado, right here at the Columbine High School, killing a bunch of kids again like they did 20 years ago, and just get all this notoriety and fame. 
And then she, you know, the law found out about it, and then she's on that being hunted by the law, and then she just took that same shotgun and killed herself. Horrible waste. A horrible waste of life. I hear things like that, it just grieves me because they went somewhere. You don't just die in this life and that's it. You go to hell or you go to heaven, one of the two. It depends on what you did with this life or which one of those you go to. But you need to remember that if you sin, if you should sin, remember 1 John 1 9. Don't ever forget that, guys. It's so important to you because if you, if you don't make that a part of your life, when you do wrong, I mean, when you do wrong, next thing you know, you quit coming through that door. Guilt, condemnation, fear, I mean, all kinds of stuff. Unworthiness, you know, I mean, just, I never was no good, no how. You know, all those thoughts will show up. No, the blood of Jesus made you righteous. Amen. Righteous. The blood of Jesus is what keeps you that way, but you have to apply it. Every time you mess up, and we all probably will one time, one time or another. Glory to God. There is no condemnation to them in, in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh. If you choose to walk after the flesh, you're going to feel guilty about it. It's going to mess with you. Go to 1 John 1.9. That's what gets rid of the guilt. That's what gets rid of the guilt. You don't get anything out of this. That's what gets rid of the guilt. Now, if you're just perfect people who are incapable of ever doing wrong, you'd have no need of this message tonight. But, you know, I have to believe that you probably, a whole lot like me, Nine is the only one that doesn't need this message. The rest of us need it bad. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We were in First uh, John chapter 3 there a while ago, were we not? Praise the Lord. Look at verse 21. I don't know if I read that or not. Verse 21. Beloved, if our heart condemns us not, then have we confidence toward God. If you've got guilt and condemnation on the inside of you, just driving you buggy over that dumb thing that you did, whatever it was, you're going to have a hard time getting your prayers answered. Amen. I kind of like God answering my prayers, don't you? Yes. I kind of like God liking me. <laughs> Kenneth Copeland said, here's his words. He said the Lord spoke to him one time. He said, son, I really love you, but I don't like you very much. <laughs> because Copeland was trying to get his spiritual legs under him, and he just wasn't doing a lot of things right. And so he had to learn a lot of things. But we're just like our own children growing up in life. I mean, we love them. We love them kids. I mean, we love them. They're born in our house. They're part of our family. But every now and then they do some things that, you little know, rascal, I don't know. <laughs> I don't like you very much today. <laughs> don't bug me. But you always love them. Amen. I think sometimes that's the same way it is with God. God said, if you want to be my friend, not according to that earlier, if you want to be friends with God, keep his word. If you want to be friends with him, just obey his word. He'll always love you, but the friendship may not be there if you don't keep his word. But he said, beloved, if our heart condemns us not, and the way we keep condemnation out, the way you keep, you know, from the crazy same we might have done, the way you get rid of that is 1 John 1, 9. Go there and confess that immediately. I mean, do it immediately. You don't have to be, you don't have to get down your knees on a busy sidewalk, but just in your heart, walking down the street, driving down the highway. You can go there in first John, and in your heart, pray and say, Father, I just messed up. Lord, forgive me. I confess it to you, Lord. Have, have mercy, Lord. I confess that sin. And you said if I would, use faithful and just to forgive me of it and to cleanse me of it. And Lord, that's all I know to do. Father, give me strength to not do it again. Well, you may do it again ten times before dark that evening, but you ten times you go back to first John one night, you just keep going back there because we're still growing. Isn't that right? Yes. Amen. You just keep you just have a living relationship with first John one nine. Glory to God. Sin that is not dealt with will lead you to spiritual death. And that's what we read in James 1 15 a while ago. That when sin is finished, if you don't deal with sin, when it's finished, you lay down. You just lay down. Your eyes are closed and your heart quit. First spiritual death, and then there you know, won't be long physical death set in. The day Adam and Eve partook of that fruit that God told them not to partake of, he said, the day you do that, you will die. Well, they lived 900 years, 900 plus years after that. Their physical body did, but the day that they sinned when God told them not to, <clears throat> they spiritually died. Took 900 years later for them to die physically, but 
from sin is finished. Death will take over. Look at 1 uh, Timothy chapter 4, if you would, please. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Hallelujah. It's just good to know some things from the Bible, guys, because if you don't, the devil will lie to you, and you won't know the difference. You won't know it's a lie. You'll think he's telling the truth. But if you know what the Scripture says, you know what the Scripture says about how to live this life, how to live victorious in this life, the enemy's got to, that's why he has to go around seeking whom he may devour, because there ain't none of them guys down to Christians who are to devour. We give him heartburn. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, I think. No, verse 1, I'm sorry, verse 1. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Does your Bible say depart from the faith? Yes. Now, I don't know how many different ways you can interpret that. The best I can figure out, the only understanding I can walk away with is they had to first be a partaker of the faith. Did they not? God has dealt to every man the measure of faith, and as a result of that, you know, you get saved, you accept Christ, because you got this faith to do that done, and you get that done, you're, and you become a Christian. Well, evidently, there's some people that did that, and they departed from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisies, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That's what sin will do to you. He'll, he'll sear your conscience till after a while that condemnation and that guilt and that uneasiness and that uncomfortableness that you felt for the sin that you did, the wrong that you did, won't be there anymore. You'll cease to feel bad about the wrong you did. And he'll take you away from the faith. He'll take you away from the body of Christ. He'll take you away from the, a relationship with God. Well, doesn't the Bible say that, that, that nothing can separate me from the love of God? Nothing can separate you from the love of God. God will always love you, but it will separate your love from Him. You'll cease to love Him. Speaking lies and hypocrisies, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So it goes on to say, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God had created to be received with thanksgiving of them that which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if, if it's received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Now I can name you off two or three religions, you know, religious belief systems, if I wanted to do so, right? that, that forbids some people in their church to marry. I mean, there's some Pentecostal belief system that forbids people in their church to marry. The Catholic system does. Uh, I mean, the Seventh-day Adventists, they're, 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 they're my brother, I believe they are. They actually, I mean, as far as I can tell, they're about as born again as you can be. But somewhere just past that, they just drop off the radar as far as their doctrine goes because they tell you it's just an abomination to God. They eat meats of any kind, really, for that matter. But this right here said, you can eat any meat you want to if you, if you <laughs> because God created it to be received with thanksgiving of them that believe in the truth. Every creature of God is good and nothing be refused. Well, believe the word and be blessed or don't believe the word and Believe a lie. <laughs> it's the only thing I know. <laughs> well, that's concerned. concern. Verse 6, if it says, If you put the brother in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine whereunto thou hast obtained. I just read in the word of God that I'm a good minister. Yeah. <laughs> you might not just automatically think so. But God said I was. Because of what I just read to you out of the Bible. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. But their con some people's conscience gets seared. It said with a hot iron. <laughs> Kenneth Hagin told this story. In fact, he told it a lot of times. He's had a whole bunch of stories, but he told the same ones over and over and over again. I mean, after a while, you, know, you run out of stories, but he did a lot of them. He told them over and over again. But he said as a young minister, he'd go live with an area uh, friend, a, a person that he knew that was uh, a deacon, elder, whatever, in the church where he was preaching at it just as a young minister he'd stay with this guy and uh, he'd, like, he'd have to walk X number of miles to get there you know and he'd stay with this fellow while he's preaching and then he'd walk back home later but uh, he said he'd come in one first time he sat down in his kitchen he cooked breakfast or something and the guy had a pot of hot coffee he said it was boiling boiling hot and he poured a cup of that in a, 
He pulled up out of the pond into a cup. That set that back on the stove. He said it was moving in the cup. It was like, he said the man turned up and drank the whole cup right straight down. Just drank the whole cup of that boiling hot coffee right down his throat and into his stomach. And never batted an eye. Just went on eating his breakfast. The reason he was able to do that is because he kept drinking coffee hotter and hotter and hotter until after a while his mouth and his throat and his esophagus and even his stomach lining had become leather, leather-like, until it was totally insensitive to heat. Well, you're just messing around with sin a little bit and a little bit and a little bit and every little bit more that, that you associate with it, you become a little more insensitive to your own spirit for the wrong that you're doing. You become insensitive and, 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 and un, incompassionate, uncompassionate, non-compassionate, toward other people. Sensitivity will leave you. Because like a hot iron, it will sear your conscience. That's when you need to abstain from saying all you can to begin with. But when you do find yourself in a sinful situation, uh, repent. Well, I mean, do it in a hurry. Repent of it. Look at Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. Glory to God in the highest. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. They did minister on the subject of sin in Bible school. They taught on the subject. They, just met, they majored, though, on, on righteousness. But I remember them talking about this particular set, the verse that we're going to right now while we were in school. But uh, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13 in my copy of the book says these words. Exhort one another daily. What is this called today? Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin will harden your heart. It's called searing like a hot iron. You're constantly seared like a hot iron in Timothy. Over here it's called hardened. Sin will just make you impervious. What's impervious? I mean, you're just not sensitive to the conviction of the Holy Ghost. You just become insensitive. I got a scar on my arm right here. I had a car wreck in 1967, I think it was. I was doing my best to kill myself and anybody got in my way. I turned the car upside down, sliding around on the top of my car and right backwards right to some people's front porch. <laughs> upside down, backwards right to some people's front porch. And they were sitting on their front porch watching this whole thing. <laughs> if I told you who it was, you'd know immediately who it was. It's over at Pierstown where that happened. 1967, 68, I don't remember the year now. But there were some folks down their best getting me sent to prison. <laughs> I'm just 17, 18 year old. But automobiles and wildcat whiskey don't go together. I got a revelation that day. I thought, this ain't working out too good. But anyway, I, I had Marvin out the window the car, turned over on Marvin. They just tore stuff all the pieces here. And I had a wristwatch, aren't they? Didn't even crack the crystal on the wristwatch. <laughs> Found it land out in the weeds about 20 yards. But that skin right there is in, it's totally insensitive. I, I can touch it. I know I'm touching it, but I don't feel anything in it because of what. Tap, the nerves have been severed. That's what happens to your spirit, man. If sin isn't dealt with, you just become totally insensitive. By the way, I can't raise my thumb up either because that leader's cut. <laughs> anyway, well, that didn't end of that story. I got a job at Sheffield Steel in Kansas City right after that. And uh, it kind of healed up pretty good. You, know, but I, you, had go, you had to go to the medical doctor, the company doctor, you know, to, to, to work there. Everybody has to go to that company doctor and be checked out, you know. And he's seen this arm messed up. He said, what happened? Well, I told him about a car wreck and this, that, that, that. Can't raise my thumb up. Well, this was in, this was in uh, December. This was in December of that particular year. And he said, I'll tell you what, if you'll come back right after the first of the year, like January 2nd, 3rd, whatever it was, because you had to be there X number of weeks or so to get past some kind of probation thing. He said, if you'll come back right after the first of the year, we'll connect that leader in there and your thumb will work good. I said, okay, see you right the first of the year. January 1st, that doctor laid down and died of a heart attack. <laughs> I never did go back. I probably should have, but they had another doctor, I'm sure. That. But I did. So, I quit a job that paid more than anything I ever made in my life. <laughs> That's a good company to work for. Anyway, they offered to fix it. Where are we at? Hebrews chapter 3, right? Verse, what did I say? Verse 20? Verse what? 13. 13. Verse 13. I exhort, so, but, but exhort one another daily what it, is called, what it is called today, lest any of you, this is written to born again people, guys, be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, because sin will deceive you. It's all right, just have a beer. 
it's okay. Take a big horn of that whiskey. I mean, I don't think we're going to make fun of it if you don't. And then you can just go down the list. What temptation will do and what peer pressure will do is get you involved with sin. Well, folks, we've got to somewhere or another make a decision. Are we committed to God or not? I mean, are we committed to our Savior or not? Where's our commitment like? It's like I've said some people, you know, time's gone past. If, if our commitment is governed by our comfort, if our commitment is governed or gauged by our comfort, we'll probably have a real shallow commitment. Because, I mean, I know people won't come to church because they're uncomfortable. They don't like the seats. They don't like the building. They don't like the... <laughs> It's got stuff they don't like. They just feel uncomfortable. But them same people, man, they're just as comfortable as they can be in Walmart or a grocery store or in the log woods where they work or on the job at the factory. I mean, that's just back-breaking work somewhere. Now, they're really uncomfortable physically, but they don't let that stop them from going there. Just because you might feel some uncomfortableness in the church house don't mean you ought not keep coming. <laughs> Just, just, just step back away from the church and just begin to not have a church life. And I promise you, sin is going to rule the day. And hardness of heart is going to set in. Until the next time somebody walks up to you and tells you about the love of God, you're going to be mad and want to hit them. <laughs> don't tell me about the love of God. I don't know about the love of God. <laughs> but if you keep that hardness out of your heart, keep the hardness out of your heart. Stay humble, guys. Stay humble. Be open to reproof. Be, be open to reproof. I'm open to it all the time. You tell me I'm crazy, and I'll probably accept it for a few minutes, and I'll tell think about it. Oh, wait a minute, i got the mind of Christ. I ain't crazy. <laughs> but you tell somebody that there's some negative thing, they immediately are mad and want to hurt you because of it. Well, humility will take a step back and say, you know, they might be right. I don't know. No, they ain't. No, God loves me. God loves me. I'm not what they just said. But you don't get mad and go to fighting and screaming and kicking. But a hard-hearted person, you can look at them just right, and they'll shoot you. They'll do it. It's, it happens all the time. It's because you looked at somebody wrong. Keep a sensitive heart, guys. Stay sensitive to one another and to God. Sin will harden your heart. Amen. Glory to God. Sin will lead you to depart from faith, my little paragraph thought. Creating a seared conscience. And that word seared, the definition means rendered insensitive. We read over where that, uh, well, let's just go back to, to first, first, well, go to Second Timothy, Second Timothy, chapter 4. Second Timothy, chapter 4. The Bible gives us examples of people who's, who have done this. They've just let hardness of heart set in and their conduct, they just departed from the faith. You know, it's an act of your will that you come to God is an act of your will that you come to Christ and give your heart to the Lord. You can also, as an act of your will, leave anytime you want to. And that's the reason pastors are working hard every day. <laughs> Exhorting people to stay firm, resist, stand. Have you done all the stand? Be strong in the Lord. <laughs> don't be moved. And, and, and don't let sin harden your heart. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9. Do that diligence to come shortly unto me. Paul talking to Timothy. He's writing another letter to Timothy. Do thy diligence to come shortly, uh, to come shortly unto me. Verse ten. For Demas, that's the fellow that was running with Paul there for a while, has forsaken me. He's forsaken Paul, having loved this present world. If you start loving the things of this world, I promise you, it'll take you away from the things of God. It'll happen every time. Those in 1 Timothy chapter, chapter 1 we read, uh, they departed from the faith. Demas here, fellow named Demas, departed from the faith because he got, the, he got his focus on the world that he was living in. You and I can look back on that world and you see it was so primitive and just so nothing <laughs> compared to what we have today. I mean, money was there, of course, and, and clothing and that sort of thing. And, uh, things of the, of the day that people desire. But we look back on that and think, man, why would anybody want to desire that? But that's all they knew. And so they desired it so much that they were willing to leave the church to get it. Do you know Jesus drove a brand new four-wheel drive? Do you know Jesus did? He drove a brand new four-wheel four, four drive, zero miles on it. Had the smell of new leather. <laughs> I don't have it in front of me. I should have looked that up. You ought to look it up in a long time. 
But the Lord told them guys, wait a minute. He said, go down where two ways meet. He said, you'll find a a a, a, a coat, not a coat, but you'll find a you'll find a, a, a donkey and it's coat, tied up where two ways meet. He said, go down there and get that coat and bring that to me. And if anybody says anything, say, just tell them the Lord has need of it. And so they went and they was untying that coat. Nobody ever wrote that thing and, and brought it. And started to leave with some guys. I said, hey, what are y'all you, you doing? What, what are you doing? They said, well, the Lord has need of it. They said, oh, go ahead. <laughs> and so they just brought it on back to Jesus. And he got on that thing, no saddle. He just got on it and rode right into Jerusalem. That's a four-wheel drive at four feet. Oh, come on, guys. That's a good one. Y'all are... <laughs> <laughs> brand new leather I have to believe that that's legitimate to read that into that I mean it's a new cult nobody ever wrote that thing Amen. it translates very easily into the transportation mode of today I think in four feet I mean and them donkeys don't fall easy they go through rough places and they just keep going that's what four wheel drives do yeah. well if Jesus can have a four wheel drive bless God I can too Zero miles. Amen. New leather. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. How do we get on that? I don't know. Demas forsook Paul, having loved this present world. If you go to put all your attention, I think it's where it's going to go. You go put your attention on this world you live and I live in. If you start focusing on that, nothing but the world you live in, that's why that's where you're going. Until you get to the point where you'll fight, kill, shoot, destroy, whatever it takes to get this world, one of the th things of this world, in your own ability. And you'll forsake the church to get it. But you just stay focused on the church. Just stay focused on Christ. Just stay focused on Jesus' word. Just stay focused on the gospel of Christ. Do your best to remember something that your pastor said. <laughs> just stay with the church. Life will get better. And the things that you desire, the Bible in so many different places to tell you that God grant you the desires of your heart. Pursue God. If you'll pursue, let me say it this way. You'll, if you'll pursue the heart of God, you'll get what's in His hands. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. I think as much as anything I'm saying here that, that in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, uh, tells you and I that the faith can be departed from. And it's because of sin that it happened. 2 Timothy chapter 4, Demas forsook the ministry, forsook the church, forsook the faith, telling you again that the faith can be departed from. And if you don't deal with sin, if you don't deal with wrong, it'll rule your day. It'll rule. It'll take over. We're just flesh people. We're just fleshly people. I mean, we're draped in flesh. But we're told by the Word of God and instructed in the Word of God to let your inward man control this outward man. And if it doesn't control it, you're an outward man. He'll be sitting down with them good old boys tipping them suds. You know what tipping suds mean? And put that Budweiser away. I never did like beer. I just drank because all the guys I was running with liked it. <laughs> I don't just like alcohol at all. It's just all the guys I run with did, so I had to drink it to stay up with them. Whoo, but it got me killed. Finally, I woke up and I thought, I don't think I would keep doing this. Second Peter chapter 2. I don't know where we're at now, but let's just go a little farther. That'd be all right. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 10. I heard a man on TV just recently. I mean, it was a Christian channel program. And he made this statement. He said, there was not anything that I had to do to get this salvation in my life. And he said, it's not anything I do to keep it. I thought, there's something wrong with that statement. There was something he had to do to get this salvation. It was an act of his will. He had to receive it. Well, if you don't control your will, your will will forsake it. But he doesn't think that way. And millions of people heard him say that on TV. And them that already tempted to go down to that beer joint went down there. Men that were tempted to cheat on their husband or their wife said, honey, I'll be back directly. You know what I'm saying? They hear that, and while they're already dealing with the temptation to do wrong, they heard that, and they say, oh, well, they not do keep this no way. I'm going to be back after a while, dear. Don't wait up. Lord help us. Verse 10, 2 Peter chapter 2. Just jump into the middle of the, the thoughts. But chiefly, them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. 
Well, verse 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Well, all you can do is pray. Have a prayer life. Jesus said, pray that you enter not into temptation. Then that, that doesn't mean, oh God, don't let me enter temptation. Oh God, don't let me enter temptation. Oh God, don't let me enter temptation. Although you can make that part of your prayer life. But the fact you have a prayer life, the fact that you do pray consistently, will give you the ability to not enter into temptation. But if you should happen to have a weak day, and a weak moment, and you do enter into it, 1 John 1, 9 is always there to help you. Amen. Amen. And to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. There's some people going to be punished and there's some people going to be blessed. The choice is ours. Which, which crowd do you want to be in? Amen. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous are they. Self-willed they are and not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Whereas angels which are greater in power and might bring not that raving accusation against them before the Lord. But these as natural brute beasts may be taken and destroyed, speak evil of things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Let me just say something real quick over in verse, 11, verse 12. I mean, I've been thinking about this all week long. Verse 12. We started this last Sunday, and I may get back into it again, but we're here tonight. He likens some people to natural brute beasts, does he not? Verse 12, natural brute beast. Let me, let me, all you got to do is step out in the pasture and look at, look at cows or horses or anything that's fenced in, any animal that's fenced in out there. Just go ahead and take you a look at them. And if you stand there and think just a little bit, you'll understand what this is talking about. A, a, a cow, for that matter, I mean, they're not all that strong, but the cow's pretty strong. I mean, an oxen, they got a lot of muscular ability, but a horse, certainly. But you can get a, you start throwing, you throw rocks at a horse, boy, he'll break and run this and take off. Man, I don't know, try to get away from that, what, that, what scared them, you know. And they'll run clear across that field to that next fence and they'll slide right up to that bob bar and stop. Because they think that's as far as they can go. That's the way natural brute beasts think. They come up to the least opposition and they think that's as far as they can go. Church houses are full of people who think like that. They come up against cancer. They come up against some disease. They come up against a financial problem. They come up against sin of some kind. They just bump that and they go, ah, but I can't overcome this no way. There ain't no way I can live this life no way. And that's brute beast thinking stops right there. When Jesus said, I'm more than a conqueror. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Thanks be unto God who always causes me to get over that fence and <laughs> get past that problem. <clears throat> Don't be brute beast. Say that ten times. Don't be brute beast minded. <laughs> I'm trying to say. <clears throat> We've got a horse up here in the field and I've watched it. He'll come, he'll see me, he'll see me, he think I'm going to feed it. Boy, he'll come across that field just in a dead run. Big horse. This thing's a Tennessee walker. This thing's huge. I mean, he'll just slide right up that fence coming to me want me to feed it something because he and he stopped because he thinks that fence as far as he can go what that horse doesn't know is he can take off running like that and go clear to the Gulf of Mexico if he wanted to never stop well you are unstoppable Amen. I don't care what the fence is I don't care what the opposition is it doesn't matter what comes up before you Almighty God is in you what stops almightiness there ain't nothing stops almightiness Amen. you and God can do anything I mean, as long as it's right. Yes. But sin will tell you, this is as far as you can go. You, I mean, after all, you sin. You sorry, you know, okay. <laughs> the devil will lie to you, you know, that stuff. Come. That's what the blood's all about. But all the above is even to say this. If you don't deal with sin, it'll deal with you. It'll, if you don't control it, it'll control you. Amen. Verse 13. Well, verse 12 again. These are natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Some people are going to, be, going to perish in their own corruption. I don't want to be in that crowd, do you? Verse 13. And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to ride in the daytime. Well, you know, most sinner people, they're, they're people of the night. They're people of the dark. They come out in the shadows. But here's a crowd that's bold and brazen. They just come out. All you got to do is watch TV just a little bit. And they're just riding in the daytime. Having mad fits in the daytime. Spots they are. Now look at it. 
blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceiving while they feast with you. It's talking about church people. They feast with you. There's churches, they're all, they're sprinkled throughout all churches about everywhere. There ain't none here, but you don't have to go very far maybe to find them. But this is defining people who were part of the faith and who have departed, they're part of it, but they've departed from it. But they're still coming and feasting, but they have a seared conscience, they have a hardened heart. And sin rules their day, but yet they want to be sociably acceptable in the church. Verse 13, receive the reward of unrighteousness as they count it pleasure to write in the daytime. Spots they are, blemishes, resporting themselves with their own deceitfulness while they feast with you. Having eyes full of adultery, and they cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have... Sin of people already that way. This is talking about people who have become this way. Verse 15, we, which have forsaken the right way. These brute beast minded people. All these people that's been defined here are people who have forsaken the right way. You can't forsake anything unless you've been a part of it. They were part of the church. They were born again people. Children of God. But they made a decision to leave. To leave God. Which have forsaken the right way and gone astray, fallen the way of Balaam. We could go back hunting, not Balaam and Bozor, who loved the wages of unrighteous. Verse 16. But was rebuked for his uh, iniquity. The dumb mass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. Let's just keep reading here. It says, These are wells without water. Who are the these? These who have forsaken the right way. Church people. Born again church people. Wells without water. You and I are wells with water. There's glory to God in that someplace. Amen. Clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. I don't want to be in that crowd, guys. But when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh. Through much wantonness, those that are clean escape uh, from them who live in, in error. I'm, I'm looking for something here if I can find it. Stay with me. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption for of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought into bondage. Of whom a man is overcome, the same is brought into... You just be overcome with sin. See what happens. You're in bondage to it. Verse 20, I think, is what I was looking for. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse than the beginning. Just be a born-again Christian. Make a decision to forsake it. And you're worse off than you were before you got saved. I don't want to be in that crowd, do you? No. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I got one, one, one last text and I'm going to close. Y'all been good congregation this evening. I, I could go on for a while with this, but I worry, yeah, I don't want to do that. Uh, look, at, look at Jude chapter 9. Oh, how many verses am I going to look at here? Ooh. Jude chapter 9. No, Jude chapter 1. I said that. Jude chapter 1. <coughs> I'm not going to read all this. We'll, we'll pick it up again next time and, and we'll cover this verse in depth. But uh, we just read while going Peter writing about some people who were spots in our feast. We know who this is. The people that were protector of the church and, and, yeah, and now are not. They've forsaken the church. Verse 12, if you look at it. These are spots in your feast of charity or of love. When they feast with you, feeding on the word of God, Feeding on the presence and the atmosphere of God in a church. Feeding, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water. Carried about of winds. Trees whose fruit withereth. Without fruit. No, uh, uh, we read that. Just get these two words here. Twice dead. See twice dead? Look at that by the words. Twice dead. I'm just going to hit on this and then we're going to close. Twice dead. Let me help you out. When you were born naturally into this world, life was pretty good until you come to the age of accountability. And if you didn't continue living right or without sin, I'll say it that way, at the age of accountability, you die spiritually. Everybody does. They die spiritually. Nobody continues living right without sin. Someone knows they sin, they know they sin, and they die spiritually, just like Adam and did. Okay, You die spiritually. That's one death. You die spiritually. <coughs> 
process of time, somebody prayed, conviction came, you repented, you got saved. You were born again. You're born naturally messed up. When you did, you know, at the age of accountability, you died spiritually. Got born again. Cadillac and long life working pretty good. And next thing you know, <clears throat> you departed from the faith, like we've been reading about some people who did here. You departed from the faith, left the church, and you spiritually died again. It sure says they were twice dead. That's what that's talking about. Once you die the second time spiritually, it's over. You have no hope of being born, no hope of salvation, no hope. But, but dying spiritually the second time, I have to help you out here, is a hard thing to do. It don't, it don't happen very easy. I was, uh, you just have to come back next time and get the rest of this, but you can read Hebrews chapter 6, and there's five things outlined that, that de determine or define what it takes to be unable to be born again again. Five things outlined. And it's talking to born again, mature, spiritually adult people who are operating in all the nine gifts of the Spirit and they've, they've had, they partook of everything God has to offer in the church world. But we ain't there yet. Me and God just look alike. I don't, I don't have everything God's got going yet. <laughs> all the nine gifts. I've operated in one or two of them maybe from time to time. Nine I have from time to time. But we're not flowing in all the nine gifts. And all the all, and everything. You read, read Hebrews chapter 6. It's outlined there. It says it's impossible to renew them again unto salvation. But that's spiritually mature people. Said all that to say this. There was a lady one time, Kenneth Hagin knew her, knew her personally. She had a beautiful voice. She was a beautiful lady. And she was born again. She operated in the gifts, man. She'd go into a church service and she'd just call out diseases and tell people even their address. I mean, she she knew anything. She just knew stuff by the gifts and all those nine gifts in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. She operated fluently and, 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 and vigorously and all that. Had, a lot, had great revelation in the Word of God. And one day a devil showed up, hopped up on her shoulder and said, you know, you're being robbed. Anybody that's as beautiful as you are and that can sing as beautiful as you are could be, have wealth and fame if you wanted it. I rebuke you, devil, in the name of Jesus. She just shook that off. I, I, I rebuke you. The little thing left. A little while later, it came back. And she did the same thing. A little while later, it came back. And this time she thought about it. I'm being robbed. I could have fame and fortune. I could have fame and I could have fortune. That devil said the world would be at your feet. And she got to thinking about it. And Dr. Hagin said the Lord showed him as he, he knew the lady. He knew her personally. He showed he, <laughs> the Lord showed him, him her and her said He said when she finally started thinking, he said a black dot, dot like that entered her thought, in her mind. And she kept thinking about it and thinking about it. And she didn't check that black dot went down in her spirit. And that's when she left her husband, her children, the church, and, and, and everything God, and went out in the world and just, just hoarded fornication. That beauty she had was lost because that's what sin does. It destroys. And he listened to this. He said, I heard her screams as she went into hell, operating in all the gifts of the Spirit. But she made a conscious decision to go after this world and forsake God. That's what sin will do for you, guys. She had born again. She had born naturally. The need to be born, be born again came because she comes to the age of accountability and, 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 and she needed to be saved. And so she was born again. And when she got born again, she rocked on through life there for a little, you know, for quite a while. And she grew in the Lord, developed in the Lord, matured in the Lord. And directly she got to thinking about how she had been cheated in life. And she forsook God and she died the next the second time twice dead well if you die the, the twice you know spiritually twice there, there's no being born you only, listen, you only get born again one time that's it now you can rededicate your life a million times but you only get born again once but if you ever reach the age of maturity in the Lord and only you and the Holy Ghost know where that's at Hebrews chapter 6 you can read it verses 1 through 6 I think it is somewhere you can read it uh, defines what those five mature things are. And once you've experienced all five of those things, then, I mean, it, like I say, it's hard to become a twice dead person. 
but it's doable. I'm confident that if you're a companion of Paul and run with him in his ministry, and you make a decision to forsake him, having loved this present world, you probably qualify for being twice dead. That's what Demas did in 2 Timothy chapter 4. You know anything on the word this evening? Mm -hmm. Don't let sin rule your day because you do. It will sear your consciousness and it will harden your heart. Well, you may backslide, leave the church, be gone for no telling how long. That doesn't mean you're going to hell. You can be, re you can rededicate your life and come on back. But the person who has matured in the Lord, what I'm trying to say, that individual is operating up here on this highest level of what God has to offer. You let them die or backslide and die the second time. There's no hope. Amen. But we're not there yet. I know whole church organizations that can't possibly be part of that because they don't even believe in the gifts. <laughs> They're born again. I'm not going to name them. They're just born again as they can. I mean, you can't be no more born again than they are. They, that's what they preach. That's their message. And they're saved and they're good Christian people. But you mentioned the gifts of the Spirit and the power of God. They just turn you off because they don't believe in that. That's all for their early church. So they no way they can ever be twice dead. <laughs> but people who believe in this power and in this the gifts of the Spirit and you can read Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 through 6, I think it is. Chat line there. He'll tell you about it. We'll pick it up next Thursday night, maybe, and talk about it. Y'all get anything out of the word this evening? Praise God. Praise God. When sin is conceived, it brings forth death. Don't let that stuff be conceived in you because it'll bear fruit. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. There's a verse over in the Old Testament that says, if you put roots downward, you put roots down, you'll bear fruit up. It just depends on what you put roots into. It defines the fruit. I mean, you can put roots in poison ivy, what kind of fruit you going to get out of that? <laughs> it's what kind of fruit you want. That's the kind of root you need to be trying to get developed in your life. Don't have a root of bitterness. Those of you viewing by the internet, by DVD, we're Mount Judy Christian Center. Mount Judea, if you want to say it right. Mount Judea, Arkansas, where pastors Gary and Nina Johnson. If you just happen to not have a church, or you live on the west coast or the east coast, it would be a good church if you start attending right here. <laughs> church Live, worth a drive. Come see us. But we're Mount Judea Christian Center in Mount Judea, Arkansas. And if you just happen to think you might want to go to heaven instead of hell, somewhere or another, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to have to get involved in your life, and he comes only by invitation. You have to invite him. You re and the way you do it, you, make, you, you repent of living that crazy life you've been living. You know what that life is you've been living. And just that old sinful, hateful life. But if you just tell the Lord, just tell Him in your own simple prayer, just a simple prayer, Lord, I'm a sinner and I want to be saved. Come into my life and help me be the person you want me to be. Just invite Him in. And more He'll come in and the Bible says He'll make a new person out of you. A new person. New creature. The Word of God said. Born again. Hallelujah. And, 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 and you read Romans 10, 9, it says, if you just believe in your heart and confess your mouth, Jesus Christ is your Lord. You believe that he died for you and rose from the dead, and you confess him as your Lord. God who can't lie said, you shall be saved. He said, you'll be saved. That's if you want to go to heaven. Now, if you want to go to hell, don't worry about it. Don't do, don't do anything. You'll get there. Muhammad can't help you. Buddha can't help you. The word of God says, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we can be saved but by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do that today and don't put it on. Until next time, God bless. Amen.